Boomerang, for those of you who don't know. I assume that the majority of the people uh, do, I'm hoping. And this uh, beautiful uh, woman in the crown is Ton Koff. <laughs> totally upstaging me. I'm beautiful. <laughs> uh, and we are from the Newer Numerous group. So uh, today we're going to be talking to you about newbie newer hacking. Uh, so first thing first, let me explain to you a little bit about our own particular flavor of neurohacking. Um, we are, we call ourselves neurophytes for neurohacking. Um, because just like operating systems, there's many different types of uh, ways, like the concept of hooking a human brain up to a machine has been around forever. Like you've probably heard wetware hacking, you've probably heard of, so everyone kind of has, uh, transhumanists, everybody kind of has different ideas. So this is not the only way, this is just a take on things that you can be doing. Um, so, because when it comes right down to it, it's your personal reality, whatever works for you, whatever gets the job done is going to be what is best. So, um, so whether or not we're your cup of tea, whether or not this is the way you would like to go about it, we're kind of hoping with this speech that we'll open your eyes up to the concept of the many different ways of the things you can do with your brain. So, uh, since the concept of neurohacking is such a huge, hugely broad uh, a subject, we, Todd and I sat down and we tried to break it up into what we consider the four main pillars of being a neurophyte <laughs> to help get you started. So, um, uh, so these pillars are electrical, chemical, biological, biomining, organic machine, and neuroethics. So what we're going to do is I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to talk to you about the first one, which is uh, uh, the electrical, chemical, biological one. So, um, and so for me to talk to you about all this, I kind of have to explain to you how the nervous system works. And now this is kind of boring, but you have to start from the beginning to get to understand the later pillars. So, I have no idea, was that me or was that you? Okay. Me, I guess. It loves me. It's me. Okay. Whoa. I'm watching you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, now that we have that fiasco, the speaker that hates me uh, under control, I'm going to talk to you about your beautiful nervous system. Isn't it gorgeous? I like it. Ooh. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask afterwards. We'll see. Um, so your central nervous system is a network of specialized tissues that can, uh, controls actions, reactions of the body, enabling it to adjust to the environment. Um, so uh, the system functions by receiving signals from all parts of the body, relaying them to the brain and spinal cord, and then sending appropriate return signals to the muscles and body organs. That's it. We're done. You know my BFF anymore. Okay. Off my Christmas card list. So, uh, so in quick summary, uh, it senses the external and external surroundings. Uh, I'm sure you guys can read. Communicates information between your brain and spinal cord and other tissues. Coordinates voluntary movement and coordinates and regulates involuntary functions like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature. Um, so if you think of your brain as a central computer that controls all body functions, I feel like I'm in a video game. I'm either going to be blind or like deaf. Okay. <laughs> uh, I feel like I should be jumping over blocks. <laughs> I missed that. Um, hello, nervous system. Okay. Uh, so if you think of it as, uh, you think of the brain as a central computer that controls all body functions, then the nervous system is like a network that relays messages back and forth from the brain to different parts of the body. Uh, to do this, uh, it does it through the spinal cord that runs uh, runs from the brain down through the back and contains thread-like nerves uh, that branch out to every organ and body part. So when a message comes into the brain from anywhere in the body, uh, the brain tells the body how to react. So the basic functioning of how the nervous system works depends on tiny little cells called neurons. Uh, neurons possess special features and unique shape, both which suit them for their job for communication. Uh, neurons have long and lanky extensions uh, that carry electrical and chemical messages to make connections with each other that affect the way we think, learn, move, and behave. 
So neurons send messages electrochemically. This means that chemicals cause an electrical signal. So the chemical messengers in the brain that our body uses to relay information and communicate with itself are called neurotransmitters. They define our moods, action, and health. Essentially, they help transfer messages through the structures of the brain and our nerve cells. So neurons don't actually touch one another. Uh, instead, the chemical message passes through one another, uh, passes through the neurons, and through a small narrow gap, this thing, <laughs> that's called the synapse. So basically how they work is they're received into, as you can see, ooh, they're received onto the other receptor through this gap, and this is where the chemicals come in. So basically there's two things that can kind of happen. Um, uh, so either it'll shoot a message and it, and it goes on to the next neuron, or it'll shoot a message and it stops. So that's kind of like the way that it works. So in either case, the, uh, after it's done releasing the neurotransmitter, it'll float back into the synapse. So each neurotransmitter uh, directly or indirectly influences, influences the neurons in the specific portion of the brain. So that affects behavior. And you're probably like, so why are you telling me this? This is kind of like boring. So the thing is, and you have to understand how this works in order to understand how drugs work in your brain, how electricity works in your brain. So a drug is broadly defined as a chemical substance that affects or processes the mind or body. So every mood-altering substance, from heroin to coffee, affects a neurotransmitter that is already in the brain, like it, for uh, where it can connect to. So some psychoactive drugs affect only one specific neurotransmitter system, uh, as where others affect many. So they work in the brain by tapping into a communication system that we just talked about, and uh, interfering with the way nerve cells normally send, receive, and process information. By they mimic or they interfere with the naturally occurring neurotransmitters that are already there. So what kind of makes uh, mood-altering imposters even more like devious is they end up being more powerful, right? Because than the one that's naturally occurring in your brain, because you can manually control how much of this is going to release. Uh, for it to hit the brain, because your brain kind of has this self-regulation process, so, you know, that you can't get too much. And since neurotransmitters uh, are central to memory, learning, mood, behavior, sleep, pain perceptions, and sexual urge, the motivation to, like, fire it off for a longer time than you would naturally uh, be able to do in your brain is understandable. So, but that being said, like, the mechanism of addiction is not fully understood. Like, all drugs of abuse, people are not necessarily going to, everybody will not necessarily become addicted. So, how it works is, generally speaking, addiction is a socially derived word that refers to a compulsive use of a drug, beside, no matter how much you are harmed by it. So, dependence and tolerance are conditions that can lead to addiction, uh, but Addiction is not necessarily dependence or tolerance. So generally, addiction has dependence and tolerance, but not the other way around. Woo. Um, so dependence occurs when after a constant supply of a drug, the brain shows uh, adaptation to the ch and changes its circuitry. When the drug is taken away, neurons have long been inhibited, start pumping out of the neurotransmitter again. So this imbalance of chemicals and brains interact with the nervous system, and this is where withdrawal symptoms come, because your brain is trying to compensate for how you've been changing it. Um, so, so we don't quite fully understand that, and we don't quite understand how tolerance works either. Tolerance is kind of what happens when you've been taking a drug for a long period of time, um, uh, and you have to take more and more of the drug in order to get the same effect. And they're not quite sure, it, tolerance is different in different people. Different people will have higher tolerance and it takes a longer time. But it all works the same. You kind of have to take a larger dose of the drug in order to get the same psychoactive effect. Um, and it happens habitually over a period of time. So how they think it works, how the hypothesis is, they're not quite sure, is they think that what happens is the equilibrium in your brain is upset. So the body actually will set up oppositional processes to restore itself. Uh, in turn, then you have to take more of the drug to overcome those processes, and in turn, your brain you know, will work harder in order to do that. So basically, it, it, it's, it, it's hard to ever, you kind of have to make broad general station, uh, uh, statements, but generally, 
All drugs that affect the nervous system, you will develop tolerance. I mean, you're always going to get a small percentage of things that don't fall the way it's supposed to, but generally they all work the same way. Um, so, every single one of us is powered by electricity, and everything we do is controlled and enabled by electrical signals that run through our body. So you guys are really going to hate me, because we only have so much time to do this speech, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. So if it's confusing, feel free to come up and ask me later. Okay, so everything organic and inorganic is made up of chemicals, right? Chemicals are made up of molecules, yes. Molecules are made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So protons have a positive charge, neutrons have a neutral charge, and electrons have a negative charge. So when these charges are out of balance, atoms become either positively or negatively charged. So the switch between one of these types of charges uh, it, uh, is what we call electricity. So since our bodies are huge masses of atoms, we therefore generate electricity. Uh, and so electricity is really the language of the brain. Um, so when you hear about the nervous system sending signals, that's kind of like what we're talking about. We're talking about electricity carrying messages from point A to point B, jumping from cell to cell, until it reaches its destination. And because electric electrical signals are fast, it allows for like nearly instantaneous uh, control responses. Uh, bless you. Since everything in your body, uh, uh, since everything in your body depends on electricity, any breakdown in the system will cause uh, real problems. When you get an electrical shock, it interrupts the normal operation of your body. So it's kind of like a power surge. And of course, at a certain level, the risk is high enough to fly, fry the electrical system of your body. Hit by lightning. You're not, the, it's very likely that you're not going to survive, depending on the scenarios, and it'll cause it not to work anymore. But what a lot of people don't know is everybody generally knows that you, know, you need to hide under trees so you don't get hit by uh, electricity necessarily, but um, electricity cannot just hurt the human body. It can actually help it as well. So it's kind of taken us centuries to get to the point where we kind of understand how electricity works in the body and how electricity can be used in medicine. Uh, today, medical practitioners regularly use electricity as part of a common treatment approach, and we hardly stop to think about it. But if you really stop to think about it, it's mind-blowing to think that we've gone from the use of electrical fish in the Roman era to treat pain to progressing to the event of brain pacemakers in the past decade. Like, this is how the knowledge has been expanding. So, it was really the early 19th century that progress in science, medicine, and natural philosophy truly exploded. It was the excitement of this movement that helped actually inspire Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein. Electricity and power generation were new concepts and were being studied, explored, and experimented eagerly. The understanding that the human body was a complex machine with a central nervous system that worked like a giant electrical power source to send electric electrical energy through the body and nerve impulses was braced as a concept taught in medical schools. So we learned that attaching electrical wires to the outside of the body actually could help us monitor the effects of the electrical activity inside. So the difference between what we know now and what we knew just 50 years ago is has forever alter the landscape of modern medicine as we know today, and will continue to do so as we learn more about the electrical signals that whiz through our body and the electrical pulses that tell our heart to beat. Future research into the nervous system will help us enable to design both and build both new types of machines and new types of drugs to help diagnose and regulate the body's electrical pulses when things go wrong in response to injury. Um. <laughs> So, I, um, you have next one? Uh, so most of us have been so worried or excited about an upcoming future event that we found ourselves unable to sleep. I can personally tell you, don't like public speaking. Sleep was not so easy for me last night. So basically, when you're stressed, anxious, or upset, your body is trying to tell you that something isn't right. So our, thought, our thoughts affect our body much more than we're aware of, and our emotions can actually have impacts on our health. And that power flows in the opposite direction, too. Eating, sex, exercise, illness, injury, and other physical experiences will also affect how you think and feel. Everybody knows that if you have a good meal, 
you feel better, you know, it boosts your sense of well-being. But if you have the flu, watch out. You're irritable and depressed and you kind of like hate everything. So, but the ebb and flow of our feelings are just the beginning of the story. So as scientists learn more and more about the secrets of physics and chemistry of both brain and the body and how our genes function, the picture of brain and body interactions is beginning to gain detail and become vastly more interesting. Already medical science research to understand how the brain and the body communicates have, fast, have provided fascinating clues to the different types of links in the brain and body in dialogue and feedback. So the brain-body loop orchestrates our most familiar routines of our lives, the daily rhythms of when we sleep, how we go about our activities, our eating behavior, our sex life, and our, the very act of us navigating our environment minute to minute. Um, the interaction the brain and body manages by this system is still such a puzzle to us, um, even as it's providing itself to be an important influence on the state of our overall health and mental vitality. It's nowhere near as cut and dry as it first appears. I don't have enough slide. No, I don't. Um, so an example of this can be seen by in the placebo effect, you know, because it's very easy to say, you know, we're kind of this, this we're kind of connected between mind and body. So the placebo effect is a, an improvement in a medical condition that causes a patient's belief as opposed to an actual treatment. And I'm sure you guys have all heard this. We all know what the placebo effect is, but a lot of people don't know that lately. We've been learning more about the placebo effect than we ever did understand before. So we don't exactly understand how positive expectations created by placebo translate into pain relief. But, and only quite recently, have we really been getting the tools so we can kind of look into this, you know, we're being able to do brain scanning and stuff. It really hasn't, we haven't really been able to look into it before. So, and so we're only hoping to begin to unravel it. We still really don't know what's going on. But there's actually been a lot of interesting things that are happening. Because a lot of people think of placebo as something like, you go, you take a sugar pill, and you think it's another pill, and you're really good. You're like, you're like, oh, wow, I feel better. But people, it's really starting to look like it's not just this psychological thing, that, you know, it's this kind of mind thing. It looks like there's actually physiological pathways that have nothing to do with expectation. So what does that mean? It means that it looks like the brain, in a particular experience, learned something and it's following a particular response which is really interesting if you think about it it's an entirely different way it's not just this kind of like i take a sugar pill or something and you consciously think you know you're thinking about it it's a subconscious thing your body's doing it you have nothing to do with it so the placebo effect there's been a lot of research in it because they're trying to understand how drug treatment works like because drugs are kind of like you know they're no magic bullet they're like you know, it, they really don't understand what's going on. So um, it's really hard to believe what little we know about our brain and our, how our brain and our body work together to help us make sense of the world around us and the world within us. So basically, we have a laboratory. We are the laboratory of our own bodies. And there is so much to discover. It's not like science has already gotten there and all these scientists have found all these things. Like, there is so much as a person experimenting on yourself that you are able to look into that answers that they don't already have. And so uh, Toddy's going to talk to you about right now about how you can find those answers without having to like, you know, uh, be a traditional scientist. No, I have a mic. So yeah, as evidenced by my hat, we're obviously not serious scientists. Um, <laughs> best hat ever. Um, like Neon said, it's really hard to believe that we're not anywhere near as self-aware as we like to think we are. Are you going to get pissed off at me too? <laughs> OK. So most of us think that if we've had food and sleep and sex, that we're OK. <laughs> but oh, well, they're off. Um, <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> what do you mean we're not serious scientists? Jeez. <laughs> scientists wish they had my hat. <laughs> I wish I had my tutu with me too. That would be awesome. I would have totally, fin totally finished university if they would have given me a hat like that. At, at the <laughs> when I was done, absolutely. All right, cool. Here we go. Um, yeah, but there's so much more than that. Uh, most of us don't know what causes us to feel the way we do. Um, or uh, if it's um, a mood during a certain time of day, 
um, but we don't feel it the next. We're like, well, maybe I'm just, you know, in one of those moods. And for women, it's that time of the month. Um, um, but there's usually a reason for it, but we don't know enough about ourselves uh, to recognize that. In order to help us figure out how we feel when we feel it um, and why we feel it, I've found that uh, biomining has been very helpful. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, biomining is the merging of the processes of uh, data mining and the ideas and goals behind the quantifiable self movement. <clears throat> Um, before I continue, how many of you know what data mining is? Yay! <laughs> Yay you! Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> but for those of you who don't, whoa, we went forward. Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, there we go. Um, so data mining is uh, the process of gathering data and analyzing it from different perspectives. Um, after that, we summarize all of the information that was gathered, and then we try to extract specific bits of information and use it as we uh, need. Um, not too terribly different from biomining, the quantifiable self movement is generally a new concept that involves the recording and uh, gathering of information about various aspects of our day to day lives um, all day, every day, for a self set amount of time. You can make it, uh, this process as simple as marking an X onto the calendar on the days that you worked out, or you can make it as complicated as filling out um, journals and graphs and charts. Uh, I personally use a combination of the simple and the complex methods. I, uh, I have three journals um, that I record various bits of information on or in. I have charts to show my uh, mood at various times of the day and um, I mark an X on the days that I accomplished everything on my to-do list, which isn't really often. <laughs> um, so after I tell people that I do biomining, they ask, and they ask me what it is, they ask, well, why should I really give a crap? And um, well, there are several reasons, including self-improvement. Um, it helps you track your different goals, like um, you can see your weight on one day, um, if you're eating the right foods, how long you're exercising. And for some people, seeing that every day helps you stay motivated. Um, along the same lines, uh, yeah, motivation. Uh, when you track your weight over a period of time, along with what you eat and your exercise habits, it's easier to see uh, that whether it's working or not. And then you're likely to either stay with the plan that you're on or you'll change it accordingly. Um, you'll also be able to establish baselines for how you normally feel um, and uh, what you do, eat, etc. And this is especially useful so that you know if you're having a persistent headache that uh, came out of nowhere. So you can just be like, oh, it's just a headache. But if it goes on for a while, you can be like, well, maybe I need to get that checked out. Um, which is very useful for those who are afraid of doctors like myself. Um, it's also great if uh, you're curious and you want to know what you eat and how that affects how you feel, or you're just lame like me <laughs> and have nothing better to do. I've been unemployed for like a year, so I vlog everything. <laughs> um, the next question is inevitably, what should I log? Um, and that's really up to you. Whatever you feel like logging, you should log it. Uh, then they ask, well, what do I log? And <laughs> there are three main categories. There's exercise. I log what time I start my jog, how far I jog, how long I jog, how long I do yoga, what type of yoga exercises I do, um, and the difficulty I had doing each exercise. Uh, from that, I can see if I need to up the sets or reps of exercises, uh, move up to more difficult yoga moves, or increase how uh, far or fast I jog. Um, I also record my food and drink, uh, what I eat, portions and size, uh, what time I eat, how I feel after I eat it. Um, and as a result, I found that after getting sick last month, I can't handle a lot of caffeine like I used to. I can handle liquor just fine, but <laughs> caffeine, it's like, no, drink. This is tequila, by the way. <laughs> Tequila, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm more <laughs> I'm more buzzed now than I was at Who's Slide yesterday. So, and I also rec uh, record various biological bits. My mood at different points of the day, any aches or pains I feel, how bad they are, um, wake times, time of sleep, quality of sleep, whether I took any naps, um, any medicine or vitamins I take during the day, my side effects to them, the severity of the side effects, the amount of the drugs I take, uh, woman's stuff, and... <laughs> <laughs> Shardy's like, go make me a sandwich. Um, and I also re uh, record random bits, like uh, what I wear that day, whether or not I wear makeup, if I do anything with my hair, do I go out of the house that day, the time that I do, how long I'm out, who do I hang out with, what do we do, how much time do I spend on IRC, <laughs> how much time do I spend dicking around on the internet, how I feel afterwards, video games I play, who do I play with, what do we play. And as a result, I found that I'm happier when I wear like iron clothes and do my hair and makeup, and I hang out with certain people and don't spend all day on IRC, which I do anyway. <laughs> all right, um, yeah. As you go throughout your day, you'll be able to see um, that most of the things that you can uh, record without any help, like how many reps you do, um, what you eat, etc. But uh, for other things that I found, it's been, use it's been useful to have different tools to help you out, including a blood pressure machine. Um, I check my blood pressure three times a day, once in the morning, once at noon, and once in the evening. Um, it's very, uh, yeah, and it helps me see, you know, when there's spikes in blood pressure, what I was doing before I took my blood pressure. Um, a pedometer, so I can track how many steps I've taken. It also helps um, when I go on my jog. It's like, oh, you've jogged so many miles. And I'm like, sweet. Um, it also does kilometers for you creepy metric people. <laughs> um, and it's also helpful. <laughs> Were any of you at Who's Slide last night? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Canada is for communists then. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess you are. Most of you are. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I also um, found that a scale to measure, uh, well, a food scale helps because you can see what your portions are, the weights of the portions. A regular scale that um, goes to a tenth of a pound, I found that to be especially useful. A tape measure, like um, the one that you would use for sewing. A clock or a watch, and miscellaneous feed, uh, biofeedback devices, and for which I'll be giving it back to Neon Rain. up to a machine is you, you are able to have this feedback. You're able to kind of think about these involuntary processes. And the whole concept is that eventually you're able to become aware of these things and then eventually you won't need the machine anymore and able to be aware of them to learn how to do them. So, uh, so biofeedback is effective for a range of health problems and it lacks the negative side effects that are usually associated with psychoactive drugs. So neurofeedback is a type of biofeedback, but instead of uh, measuring body functions, it uh, measures brain functions uh, with electrodes. So, and it works the same way. The machine uses the, gives the user feedback uh, so they know what they're doing, but instead of involuntary body functions, uh, it, will, it shows you brain waves instead. So, because so, it's kind of hard like, you know, 
if, if I asked you how many breaths per second you just took, like, in the last minute, you're not going to be, if you can, then, dude. But uh, you're probably not going to be able to tell me, or, or if you have any idea, like, what your brain waves have gone through. So the idea is if you're able to hook yourself up to a machine, it, it makes you aware of these things that you uh, take for granted that we're luckily made so well to be able to do it. Okay. Hopefully, I'm trying to make sure. I always like have so much information, so I take so much time. So when you're talking with another speaker, it's kind of hard. You're kind of like doing this relay race tag, so you don't want to cut into their time. So I'm sure you guys are ask, thinking the question right now, OK, well, if biofeedback and neurofeedback are so awesome, then why don't I have like a machine? Why is my doctor not doing it? Uh, unless the super cool people who totally do. Uh, 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 me too. But um, so, but the problem with uh, biofeedback is uh, the bad news is not only do you need specialized equipment to do it, right? And anything that's specialized is money, money, right? Um, the progress you make is at a snail's pace, as you can imagine. Um, it, it, it takes a large, high degree of motivation and commitment and effort to train yourself to do a new skill, and it's both boring and expensive. Like, it's both boring to do and expensive to pay for. So, I mean, if you decided to use biofeedback, you are kind of like, strap in, you're in for a long-term thing. Like, it's going to, I mean, it could take years in order to really be aware. But it works, right? But, I mean, it, it's not, you know, in this uh, world where we want it now, it's not necessarily the best thing, especially when we have to pay and wait. There's nothing worse in North America than not telling someone they have to pay a lot of money and they have to wait for it. Um, so now that we know a little bit about biofeedback with the body and neurofeedback with the brain, it opens up a whole world of projects to us as neurophytes. So part of the solution to this biofeedback problem is that to, for us as neurophytes to help make the equipment both affordable and accessible to the average person. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about a few projects that will hopefully spark your passion and your imagination to get you thinking about the kind of stuff you'd like to do. So. Wow. Oh, you're right there. Sweet. Okay, first project. So you can build yourself a biofeedback device that uses LED lights. So I'm sure you guys all remember that I mentioned that the brain's made up of billions of brain cells called neurons and that they use electricity to communicate with each other and that the combination of these millions of neurons sending signals at once produces an enormous amount of electrical activity in our brain. So our mind regulates uh, activities by elect like electrical waves that are, um, that are registered in the brain. So these tiny electrical impulses of varied frequencies were kind of really given a name in the 1940s, even though we, we've always kind of known, you know, the flickering lights of uh, fire and stuff, you know. And um, this effect is called the brain frequency following response. So basically, you can make yourself a set of goggles that use LED lights that flicker at a certain rate. So you can check out this effect yourself. So I'm not just here like, hey, this is cool. You could totally do it yourself. And it's a quick and dirty way of using a machine to give you the ability to alter your current state of consciousness. It's, it's, you can kind of feel your brain shift. It's kind of, if, have you guys ever worked under like fluorescent lights and you like feel like crap? That's the brain, that's the flicker rate, you know? So it, it affects, but you're still doing what you need to do. So, I mean, it, it's a quick and dirty way in order to do it. Um, so if you would like to build a set of these um, in order to change the current state of your consciousness, there's lots of information on the internet if you just Google for uh, brainwave machine schematics, you will find your own schematics if you're really good at engineering to build it at, at home. But if you're, right, yeah, I'm getting to that. I'm, I'm all over it, boy. <laughs> so, but uh, if you're looking for a good beginner project um, for someone just starting out without a lot of knowledge of electricity, I highly recommend the kits that Mitch has created, the brainwave goggles. And he, uh, we're lucky enough to have one of these. Um, and if, Mitch, of course, he's in the Hardware Hacking Village. Uh, Tony, please tell me about these beautiful brainwave goggles. Well, it works especially. It works especially well if you've been drinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. Um, 
So these are the trip gloves. Well, so <laughs> really well. So these are the trip glasses. Uh, he has uh, Mitch has these upstairs for uh, forty dollars a pop. Wow, um, dollars? That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, he also has the regular brainwave goggles for $20. Um, and what these do is it has a um, LED that blinks, and then you put on the headphones, and it plays uh, a sound. And then with the trip goggles, which these are, you start to hallucinate. Unless you have epilepsy, then you're going to spaz out. Or, yeah, or meditative, <laughs> like, yes, absolutely. So they are, they are upstairs for purchase. If you would like uh, something quick, easy, you're like, I think I, I, I approve of this and or product and or message by Mitch. Uh, so if you wanted to try something really quick, you're like, that would be awesome. Uh, he definitely has them upstairs. So, another way of doing biofeedback is you can use, uh, make a biofeedback device that is used by heart rate. Um, th uh, there's a lot of information on the internet about building your own homebrew EKG machine. Um, it, it's really weird, like, uh, they both use EKG and ECG, like, it's the same thing, they just, anyway, that always pisses me off. Um, so, uh, you can hook it up to your PC to monitor your heart rate. So the biofeedback device can be used in uh, uh, a, num a number of ways. And an example of the project that the newer numerous group has actually done in the past is we created a proof of concept video game that uses a homemade EKG as an input device. So, um, so basically the premise was of this is, um, and I always love being part of the newer numerous group. We have uh, done a lot of projects and we always make jokes. So this was our take your shirt off for science joke uh, uh, project. Uh, and basically what it was is uh, we had space invaders. Right? And so you would get, you guys have been in the hospital before, you know the little red dots, or if you've watched ER shows and they hook you up, the little sticker things. So basically how the premise worked is that it was for kids with ADD, uh, and what would happen is if you got too stressed out, the gameplay would stop. And you would not be able to play the game again until you calmed your butt down. So, um, so those schematics are all online. If you're like, dude, that's awesome, I would like to build one. Uh, if you just Google DEF CON 16 uh, EKG video game, um, and all the slides will be, uh, all this information will uh, be up on Tottenkoff's uh, uh, site. I'm totally thrown by someone at the table that I don't know. Hello, person. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, tequila. Oh, dude, dude. Go one for you. I like you already. Okay, so uh, you should be able to find all the schematics that you need to build it. So, sorry, I get thrown off easily. Uh, how are we doing? We're doing okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm talking so fast. Lots of information. So, if you wanted to try out neurofeedback at home, you could build your own EEG. Uh, when uh, neurons of the human brain process information, they do so by changing the flow of electrical currents across the membranes. So these changing currents generate electrical and magnetic fields that can be measured and recorded by attaching small electrodes to the surface of the skull. And these recordings show the overall activities in the millions of neurons in the brain. And these readings, of course, are called EEG recordings. I'm sure you either have heard of them or seen them on TV. So the Open EEG project, uh, who I also highly recommend um, and approve of their message, uh, they were formed in 2000. And they're an open source hardware and software organization aimed at bringing EEG research to students at low cost. They rock. I cannot say enough about how amazing these people are. So along, uh, uh, along with their low cost hardware, many different software packages have been released. So all this uh, schematics and source code and project information is available to the public to download for free. Um, if you just simply Google the term open EEG, it'll like bring you right to the information you need to build an EEG of your very own. Just be warned, building an EEG from scratch, not a simple project. Um, I would not recommend this as a first project or a second project or a third project. I wouldn't even recommend this as a project to me if I would have done it. Um, unless uh, you have a strong electrical engineering background and even then I highly advise you to buy the pre-assembled boards and, and uh, unless you truly hate yourself. Going through the process of building that machine from uh, the boards, um, the rest of the group, I yeah, it was, 
Yeah, there was a lot of science snacks going on there, like a lot of bribery of trying to, it, it was hard and long, and, um, but totally worth it, because we have a cool EEG now, right? But it, this is kind of like, if you'd like to build this project, you really kind of have to know a lot of engineering and like uh, just going to get a kit uh, from Mitch. So, next slide. Yay! So, sexy, sexy. Biofeedback and neurofeedback are not the only ways you can play with your brain. A brain-computer interface, and sometimes called a direct neuron interface or brain-machine interface, is an external device that communicates directly to the brain of humans or animals. These external devices can either transmit or receive signals to and from the brain, which can then be used to gather data uh, from the brain and restore function and movement in sensory organs or limbs. So these external devices can range from simple circuits to ad uh, advanced silicon uh, chips. Okay. Um, the reason uh, a brain-computer interface, or BCI for short, because I don't want to keep saying brain-computer interface for the rest of this section, is uh, the way it works is because of our brain functions. Now, I'm sure you guys are sick of it by now, but our brains are filled with neurons. And these neurons help us move, feel, and remember things. So although the path and signals that they take are insulated, uh, within the neuron, some of the electrical signals escape. So scientists can detect those signals and interpret what they mean to use uh, them to direct a device of some kind. It can also work the other way around, too. Uh, for example, researchers can figure out what signals are being sent to the brain via the optic nerve when someone sees something, like the color red. So brain-computer interfaces break down into three categories. So non-invasive BCIs, invasive BCIs, and partially invasive BCIs. So, well, I don't think I didn't. It's probably boring. That's why I didn't make a slide of it. <laughs> so, invasive BCIs. So, invasive BCIs, they have the best signal, right? Because they're implanted directly into the brain. But you don't encounter these too often because there's major risks with surgery. Um, and they are usually used for paralyzed people to provide uh, functionality. Uh, invasive BCIs can also used to be used to restore vision by connecting the brain to external cameras and to restore the use of limbs. And of course, to be used to control robot arms and legs. Uh, the problem with the type of device, though, is that scar tissue can form, because if you insert something into your body that's not supposed to be there, that's foreign matter, your body doesn't like that too much. So, if you, uh, so what happens is that eventually, of course, depending on the person, you will, the scar tissue will start to interfere with um, the efficiency of the implant. And of course, if you have surgery, you've got, you're implanting stuff into the brain, you have the risk of infection, so there's a whole lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily want to do. So, non-invasive brain-computer interfaces, uh, they have the least signal clarity when it comes to communicating with the brain. But of course, they're the safest, we're not cutting through the skull and opening it up. Bone is actually a major barrier. It dampens electrical signals. The skull itself is such a good insulator that it ends up degrading the signal a lot. Um, but even with these limitations, uh, these types of devices have been found to be successful in moving muscle implants and restore partial movement. So partially invasive BCRs are kind of like the best and worst of both worlds. Uh, they have, uh, some of the components are implanted into the brain uh, and some of them aren't. So you, you kind of have less risk of scarring and a better signal. Um, but the, the bone tissue is still a problem because it's, uh, it's stopping the signal from going through. So, so of course, as you can see, like, one of the biggest drawbacks is the basic mechanics of the interface itself. Because like biofeedback, uh, BCIs don't work uh, perfectly. The brain is incredibly complex. I mean, when I come up here and I tell you, I'm like, blah, blah, electricity, blah, blah, chemicals, blah, blah, it, I'm simplifying it to an incredible level. Um, there's so much going on in the brain, like uh, constantly sending and receiving signals. Um, and then the signals we do get, they can be weak. We can't really understand what's going on with them. 
and the part to interference, I mean, you blink, you move, all, all the electrodes are like, uh, go crazy. And everything isn't really portable. I mean, it's a lot better than it used to be. Like, you don't have like these huge craze that you're kind of like tied to, but you're still kind of tethered to huge machines. And I mean, now with wireless and stuff coming out, it, it's getting better, but where we are right now in this period of time, we're not at a point where we're really, uh, that we're kind of just still wading our way through. We're kind of like feeling our way through in order trying to figure it out. So, okay, I'll talk really fast. Very, very fast. So, Todd, you can do. Okay, very, very quickly. There are brain computer interface projects, open source projects. They actually do exist. People are doing this and offering free information. I will go really quick. First is Open Vibe. And they are awesome because they are offering free, it's a software platform dedicated to designing, testing, and using brain computer interfaces. All their stuff is for free. So, they're trying to totally get. Uh, people are able to give, what they're trying to do is make it modules, so you can write modules and people can take this and use it for biofeedback and neurofeedback and all this stuff. Open RTMS is, they're trying to be similar to the EEG uh, project. Uh, basically, um, RTMS is uh, magnetic instead of electrical. Uh, Toddy will be covering it more. Um, and so, uh, so basically, um, I'm trying to do this really quick. Magnetic goes really quickly, and uh, magnetic is, goes easier than electrical into the brain. Uh, the last one is the sleep lab. So the neuronumerous group, uh, we created a sleep lab last year uh, using uh, an EEG as a BCI and a bunch of uh, biofeedback devices. So I'm sure you guys have all gone to sleep labs. You've heard like for apnea and stuff, and they monitor your sleep because uh, we're really devoted to the concept of open source medicine that you can eventually get to a point where you have a device, you give it to your doctor, and you're like, dude, I'm not waiting in your waiting room for 30 minutes. Here's the device. You know, I totally uh, don't need to be here. So if you Google the term uh, DEF CON 17 sleep lab, if you would like a sleep lab of your own, uh, you can totally have one. And it's all up to you now. Hopefully, that was really fast. Yay! So it's all up to Toddy now. So while you were talking, my mom and Nikita both called me. <laughs> I hope they're well too. All right, so. <laughs> okay, Shabby. <laughs> Okay, so um, another important aspect of um, <clears throat> neurohacking that isn't often considered when it comes to hacking um, of any kind are the ethical implications of what we're doing. Um, I, my, I myself have a moral campus that's always pointed north. So, um, what? <laughs> nice. Um, <clears throat> In fact, um, ethics plays an even bigger role in neurohacking than it does in any other form of hacking. Um, before we get into why that is, we are first going to cover um, what ethics is. That means next slide. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so, ethics is a branch of philosophy that deals with values relating to human conduct with respect to the um, rightness and wrongness of certain actions and to the goodness and badness of the motivations of um, the end result of said actions. Um, people often confuse being ethical with being moral. Um, they're very similar, but they, there is a distinct difference. Um, usually it's determined by, um, so ethics is usually determined by society or community, and, um, or I'm sorry, that the society or community that the individual belongs to, um, and morals, um, morals is a, wow. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, morals is similar to ethics, except for um, morals are determined by the individual. Five. Okay, awesome. Okay, next. 
Neuroethics. So neuroethics is considered to be a subclass of um, an ethical class, which is uh, bioethics. Um, the term neuroethics has thought to be around since the beginning of the 21st century, and um, which has been evidenced by written work and speeches given by ethicists and philosophers. While there is no universally accepted definition, most people seem to think neuroethics to be nothing more than um, just the ethics of the brain. The director for Dartmouth's College of um, Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, however, says that it's much more than that, but is more specifically the examination of how we want to deal with the social issues of disease, normality, morality, mortality, um, lifestyle, and the philosophy of living informed by our understanding of underlying brain mechanisms. So now we're going to talk about current uh, neuroethical social issues, which evidenced by the slide. Um, first off, we're going to talk about the transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. It's a non-invasive method of exciting the neurons in the brain. Uh, weak electric currents are induced in the tissue by rapidly changing magnetic fields, which triggers uh, brain activity with minimal discomfort. Neon already t uh, talked a little bit about what RTMS was and how it works on the same principles of TMS. Uh, numerous small-scale pilot studies have shown it could be a treatment tool for various psychological conditions as well as uh, long-term depression. And um, there aren't a lot of studies as far as the, um, when it comes to the long-term side effects of TMS and RTMS. So, um, the, so therefore, TMS is also a good example of how a budding neurophyte will have to rely on his or, own, his or her own moral compass. They have to decide whether they are okay with the risk of the unknown when working on a project that involves something that is as new as TMS um, and that hasn't been proven to have more benefits than long-term risks. Next, we're talking about brain readings. Currently, we use imaging methods like MRIs to do everything from diagnosing ailments such as cancer to see if someone is uh, lying about a crime that they're suspected of. There's already a company, in fact, Brain Fingerprinting, uh, brain fingerprinting uh, Laboratories that markets a system that uses uh, scalp-recorded event-related potential to detect so-called guilty knowledge, um, such as familiarity with certain people, um, Oh, wow. I have two minutes. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, there's also pharmaceutical enhancement, which, which has been popular since the 90s. We use um, things such as Ritalin to stay focused and to help us study. Um, people are concerned with using pharmaceutical enhancement, such as safety. You know, what's, what's, um, what's going to happen to us if we use prescribed medications for non-prescribed methods, character, <coughs> justice, and autonomy. Court-ordered CNS intervention. <laughs> Clockwork Orange, yeah. Um, so it's becoming more and more popular for courts to order uh, drug therapy. Um, it's also, um, they're using it for everything from rape, uh, burglary, to racism. Really? A minute? Wow. OK, so fuck court-ordered CNS intervention. Next. <laughs> Human testing. So when you make a new thing with a um, new machine or project in neurohacking, you have to decide whether you're going to test on some, someone else. Um, don't be a dick. Tell them what you're doing, what uh, the risks and side effects are. Um, let them know what everything is. And have them sign something so you can cover your ass. Um, what if I test my projects on myself? Um, well, there's a lot, lot less legal liability unless you kill yourself. Um, because suicide is illegal. <laughs> um, make sure someone is there to call 911 and have fun. Next. Sharing. So people are dumb. They'll try your experiment if you present on it. And they'll get hurt because they're dumb. And since we're in America and we like to sue people, they'll try to sue you. <laughs> yes, America. Fuck yeah! And so they'll try to sue you. So. Uh, when you're presenting this information, just be, you know, give a discretion saying, you know, this isn't proven, your results may vary, blah, 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 blah. Is that it? Yes! yes. Oh, yes. So, oh, we, we know We're it's done. a lot of information, we're sorry, we know it's a lot of information, we had to go yeah. really fast. Um, um, next year we're hopefully going to present just 
directly on projects and stuff. So if you have questions, please come and ask us. We know we covered a lot of stuff. So And um, we'll be posting the speech and the PowerPoint presentation on totenkoff.com, which is spelled the way my hat is. <laughs>